So exercise in normal subjects, it's, it's usually limited by perception of limb fatigue and breathlessness. So limb fatigue is going to be related to how much oxygen is getting to working muscles. Um, breathlessness is going to be related to the tolerance of carbon dioxide. And this is influenced by the capacity of red blood cells to deliver oxygen to the tissues. So performance, sports performance, it usually improves with an increase in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, as you're aware of, are the oxygen-carrying molecules in the blood. So 98% of oxygen is carried in the blood by hemoglobin. And hematogrid is the percentage of blood with oxygen carrying capability. Which, if you improve or increase hemoglobin and hematocrit, you increase oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and you improve aerobic ability. So you improve sports performance. And the goal of increasing oxygen carrying capacity spurs some athletes to participate in anti-competitive practices such as blood doping. And of course, you'll all think of Lance Armstrong at this moment, um, with his, his bags of blood taken straight from the refrigerator to, to reinfuse it into the body to improve his oxygen carrying capacity. And it goes to show the lengths that athletes go to improve their oxygen carrying capacity. And in the 1990s, the hormone EPO had become the drug of choice among athletes seeking to increase their endurance performance, EPO or EPO. So EPO is a hormone which is secreted by the kidney in response to chronic hypoxia. So we can actually synthesize and stimulate the generation of our own EPO. And the EPO stimulates the maturation of the red blood cells in the bone marrow increasing oxygen delivery to muscles, thereby enhancing sports performance. It makes sense that the body, when it senses there's a drop of oxygen, there's an adaptation that takes place to release more red blood cells with oxygen carrying capacity into circulation. And EPO is the hormone that does that. So, since there are limits to the amount of oxygen delivered from the lungs, improving efficiency with available oxygen uptake is a plausible option. And at higher altitude, athletes go up into high altitude, they train at higher altitude, oxygen levels are lower, resulting in, if you were to monitor with a pulse oximeter, the saturation of arterial blood with oxygen is going to drop. It's no longer 95 to 98, it may drop down to pre-90, pre-85. So the higher you climb, the more your oxygen saturations drop. And as your oxygen saturations drop, um, the kidneys will synthesize EPO. But a secondary effect here is that the spleen, which is your blood bank, and it contains 8% of your total red blood cell count. When your spleen senses, when your body senses there's a drop of oxygen, your spleen will start releasing more oxygen in, into circulation. So there's a double effect. So the main premise of altitude training <coughs> is to increase red blood cell count thus improving oxygen carrying capacity. And if you improve oxygen carrying capacity, you improve VO2 max. And VO2 max is the holy grail. That and breathing economy. If you can improve oxygen carrying capacity to working muscles, you're going to get athletes on your side. And different people, of course, use high altitude training. It was first noted in the 1960s, the Mexican Olympics. A lot of athletes went to partake in the games, but they found that their performance was less because they were performing at high altitude, because there's resistance there, there's not sufficient oxygen. But they found when they came back from the games that their performance was better than it ever had been before. So then the association was made between high altitude and the effect of high altitude and improving sports performance. And it was Levine and Gunderson, two American researchers who came up with the concept of live high, so you live at high altitude to subject your body to hypoxia, but then you come down to sea level to train. Because if you try and train at high altitude, you're going to be limited by the fact that the oxygen levels are less, so you won't be able to push your body. So you could have muscle deconditioning. So if you live high and train high, you could have poorer performance. But if you lived high, you get the benefits of reduced oxygenation and come down to sea level and train, 
you can push your body so you have muscle conditioning as well. You understand? So just to live high and train low. And different centers throughout the world all look at the effects of um, hypoxic training by elite athletes. And so many athletes actually sleep in hypoxic tents. So they have a tent over their bed which pumps in nitrogen to displace oxygen. So it drops oxygen from maybe 21% of atmospheric pressure to 14%. And by dropping oxygen, your body again is making those adaptations. So oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, this is a study looking at the effect of oxygen saturation at high altitude. <coughs> so oxygen saturation of hemoglobin was less than 91% for approximately 24 seconds during exercise at 1,000 meters, which is not altogether that high. And for 136 seconds for exercise at 2,100 meters. And following this, EPO level significantly increased. So at 1,000 meters for 24 seconds, EPO increased by 24%. And at 2,100 meters for, 30, for 136 seconds, EPO increased by 36%. So if you can show an individual how to reduce their oxygen saturation to below, to below 90%, and if you can maintain it, for 24 seconds, you will show from this, you can deduce that EPO is going to increase by approximately 24%. Or if you can reduce oxygen saturation for a minute and a half, it will have a stronger effect. So the reaction as regards the kidney synthesizing EPO is based on two factors. One is, can you drop oxygen saturation? And the second is, for how long can you drop the oxygen saturation for? So there's two factors. And in this study here, this is the live, live high, train low effect from Levine and Stray Gunderson. Post-altitude results showed a 5% improvement to red blood cell volume, a 9% improvement to hemoglobin concentration, and a 5% improvement to maximal oxygen uptake. So the improvement of VO2 max was in direct proportion to the increased red cell mass volume. And that makes sense. You improve oxygen carrying capacity, you can get more oxygen delivered to working muscles. And this is using high altitude as a means of doing that. And this section investigates whether we can produce similar effects. Because training at high altitude is not always feasible. It's not exactly that you have a lot of mountains in this country. <coughs> and athletes can go and train at high altitude. So it would be, you can afford, you can offer a, a plausible or a different route um, to athletes and show similar effects. So here we're looking at breath holding and seeing if breath holding can produce similar effects to training at high altitude.